Occult imagery has appeared in film since the very beginning. The sorcerer, the demon, the magical texts, ghosts, and vampires have long dominated the Western imaginary, and it's unsurprising that magic and film are so well suited for each other. Despite this marriage, depictions of the occult broadly understood as magic, mysticism, and alchemy, and film are very uneven and very rarely rest on solid historical research. Of course, not every film should strive for a documentary depiction with only scrupulous attention to historical or scholarly detail. They should also tell a good story, and if an occult or arcane device helps that along, great. Though, when a filmmaker really puts in some research and manages to tell a compelling story, that's all the better, at least for me. I want to do a short review of a film that I think manages to strike this balance. In this video, I want to discuss the 2016 film A Dark Song, directed and written by Liam Gavin and starring Stephen Oram and Catherine Walker. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. A couple of caveats to start. Number one, I'm not a film buff and can't claim the least bit of expertise when it comes to film analysis. What strikes me as interesting in a film might not be what grabs or impresses a real film critic. I'll be focusing primarily on how the occult functions in the film and why I think it handles this material in a refreshing and thoughtful manner. And two, spoilers ahead. If you haven't seen the film, maybe check it out first. I rented it on YouTube for about $3 American and I'm sure you can stream it on the various online streaming services. A Dark Song follows a bereaved mother, Sophia, employing the ritual expert Joseph Solomon to perform the grueling and complex Abramelin ritual in order to summon Sophia's guardian angel. Why? To exact revenge on her son's killers. The film employs a kind of modified Faustian trope, that is, the use of the supernatural to gain power at some dire cost. In Faust's case it was knowledge, but just as often it's vengeance or love, and given the Faustian arc, things will often go terribly, terribly wrong. Though this is where a dark song also does something interesting and novel with that Faustian trope. More on that later. The substantial thing that makes this film work for me is the world building done by the writer and director Gavin. It succeeds because it's very clear he's done his homework. Subtle nods abound. The main protagonist, Sophia, whose name means wisdom, may evoke the dangers of the evocation itself calling back to the old Gnostic myth, where in that myth, Sophia, through her ignorance, begets the hideous demigod Yao de Baoth and the creator of this wretched physical reality and all of its demonic power. Sophia, the protagonist in A Dark Song, herself unleashes demonic power beyond her control and her quest for vengeance. The other protagonist, or antagonist, depending on how you want to spin him, Joseph Solomon, likely a Jewish name, evokes the biblical Solomon, who summoned demons in the service of the construction of the first temple and the likely Jewish origins of the Abramelin ritual itself. I also like how this film disrupts traditional imagery of the conjurer. Our conjurer here, Solomon, is often depicted wearing badly fitting jeans, an old army jacket, and a bucket hat. While he still wears ritual robes throughout various parts of the film, we don't get the typical elderly bearded wizard or the snazzy, well-dressed, handsome magician. His power is in what he knows, not how he appears. The central ritual that frames the film is the infamous Abramelin operation. In short, the Abramelin ritual is a complex series of conjurations, punctuated by a grueling 18-month schedule of fasting, ritual purity, abstinence, in which the practitioner evokes and binds a dozen major demons, after which one can command them based on who they are with the eventual goal of summoning and conversing with one's own guardian angel. The angel will reveal divine and powerful secrets, though the text itself is conspicuously silent about what this revelation will entail. If you're curious, I'll be making a video on the Abramelin text itself. The text is itself very complicated and there's a very rich history there, so subscribe and stay tuned for that. Further, the film evokes the Abramelin in perhaps its most famous evocation, that of Aleister Crowley at the Boleskine House at Loch Ness. Indeed, the film even evokes the early libertine Crowley in the character of Solomon, whose alcohol abuse is revealed in the DTs he experiences while undergoing the initial purification for the ritual and the sexual manipulation of Sophia later in the film. As described in his own auto-hagiography, Crowley always had a profound sense of self-promotion. A year after being initiated into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, 
Crowley began preparations to undergo the operation by sequestering himself in the house at Loch Ness. The house was an ideal fit, just as in the film. It's secluded and various rooms have to face various specific directions throughout the operation of the rite. While Crowley began the ritual, he was likely using the defective translation uh, done by Mathers. I say it's defective, uh, there are numerous sections missing. The sacred oil required in the ritual uses an incorrect ingredient, and even the length of the evocation is corrupt. In the earlier, more reliable German manuscripts, the ritual takes at least 18 months, whereas in the Mathers text it's a mere six. At any rate, Crowley did allegedly start this process, and he did, according to him, manage to summon some demons into semi-corporeal form. However, Crowley abandoned the ritual only about a month in, I think this is in November of 1899 if I'm correct, to travel to Paris to deal with the internal political fractioning going on within the Golden Dawn. The legend now has it that while Crowley did summon some of the various demons, he failed to bind them, and that a curse actually fell upon Beleskin House but sadly caught fire and has been totally destroyed in recent years. An organization has thankfully sprung up to help restore the house, and that's important. Uh, the Bleskin House is an uh, important location in Scottish history. It's also an important religious site. Thelemites, followers of the religion founded by Alistair Crowley, actually face in that direction while they engage in their rituals. I'll include a link to the organization helping to restore Bleskin House in the description if you're interested in getting involved. Of course, the film isn't a perfect expression of the Abramelin ritual, and nor is that required. It isn't a documentary on the ritual, but a tale about the terrible places grief can lead us and the dangers of invoking powers well beyond our control and the service of some of our darkest desires. That said, one could easily nitpick. There are banners that seem to have random Hindi letters. There's a scene where Solomon's painting Chinese characters on Sophia's back. The absence of the magical squares, which are actually the core part of the Abramelin ritual itself. There's a scene where there is actually blood drinking, which would be completely anathema to the uh, Kabbalah Maaseh, which underwrites the, the Jewish core of the Abramelin ritual itself. Even the seclusion itself, while required in the Crowley and the film version of the Abramelin ritual, isn't required. If you actually read the original text, it even tells you that one of the ethical things you have to do is maintain scrupulous dealings in business, which assumes that if you're doing business with people, throughout the course of this 18-month uh, ritual endeavor, then you're not secluding yourself completely in the middle of the Welsh countryside or on Loch Ness. What the film does capture brilliantly is the grueling character of the ritual, the profound asceticism, repetitions, and inhuman patience required to affect the power of the ritual itself. In our days of instant gratification, on-demand everything, and prime delivery, the Abramelin appears as an utterly impossible spiritual ascent and the film captures the extreme spiritual athleticism required by much of early and pre-modern spiritual practices. As I mentioned earlier, in the original text, it's only after 18 months of this work that one can begin to see the supernatural effects begin to appear. The film captures this well. Seasons pass in the film without there being any noticeable effect at all. This is shown in Sophia's increasing impatience with the ritual. And when things do begin to occur, for instance, a bird slams into one of the windows as they're having one of these conversations, and when those magical effects do begin to appear, it could just be ex post facto reasoning. It could just be the characters looking for a reason to believe that the magic's actually beginning to work. But when the magic does work in the film, it is positively terrifying. If the first two acts of the film are relatively free of the supernatural, then the third is full of it. Sophia, following the slow coming death of Solomon, breaks the sacred barrier, which isn't required in the original Abramelin text, and after an attempt to escape, is forced back into the house. She returns to this large estate in Wales to find it dotted with vomit and smeared with blood and feces. The house is positively infested with demons, which drag the body of Sophia and Solomon into a kind of hellish basement. And it's here that we get something of the classical Faust trope. The demons began torturing Sophia by cutting off one of her fingers, and what one actually imagines is something like the same vengeance she wished upon the killers of her own child. Perhaps it's undergoing this torture that reveals to her the profoundly hollow nature of the very vengeance that she originally sought after. Her repentance is her breakthrough. As she makes her way toward the light out of the hellish basement and away from the literal grips of the demons, she's finally granted a vision of her guardian angel. The angel is truly a sight to behold, and they do a stunning job depicting this entity. And it's very much in line with the Hechelet literature, the Jewish mystical literature which describes these angels in stunning detail. And what we get is something beautiful, 
terrifying, militant, and regal. And it's here that the film does something interesting by breaking with the traditional Faustian trope. Sophia achieves just that. She achieves wisdom. She lives up to her name. And that wisdom is rather than the power of vengeance, it's the power to forgive. Both the killers of her son and, just as importantly, to forgive herself for the guilt that she feels for her son's death. After providing Solomon with a water burial, which by the way meant that she had to off-screen go back into that hellish basement and confront that demonic horde, she cranks her car and successfully leaves the confines of the ritual, but also of her rage, her grief, and her guilt. A passing car provides a slight jump scare. She's been sequestered so long with the magical that the normal itself now appears frightening. It's carefully thought out, paced well, and genuinely scary at times and employs that Faustian trope in a novel and emotionally rich manner. Like I said earlier, I'm not a film buff, but if you're interested in a well-researched and engaging depiction of magic on screen, the infamous business with Crowley at House Beleskin, or a rumination on the power of grief, isolation, and vengeance, this is a great film. I don't know how many film reviews we'll do here at Esoterica, but as new films on the occult pop up, or old ones that are really great, I'll try to cover some of them. I myself am looking forward to the Craft remake. If you're interested in the Abramelin operation and the text behind it, stay tuned. I'll be covering it as a part of our series on magical books. I'll also include some book recommendations in the description if you want to read more about the Abramelin, Beleskin, and other things I've talked about in the video. And if you're interested in topics on esotericism, magic, witchcraft, alchemy, mysticism, subscribe. It's the main thrust of our channel, and maybe you'll consider supporting us on Patreon. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.